asking, what's wrong with your foot? Are you just getting that old? You, you hop around like you're, Shannon, Shannon did it, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah, you run your mouth and Shannon put a hurting on you. And uh, I don't know if anybody in here has ever dealt with gout before. And if you have, um, it feels like your foot's broke. It feels like you're trying to walk on a broken bone. And first time it happened, I was actually on a treadmill and been doing that every day. And I honestly thought I broke a bone in the upper part of my foot. And I left and went to my primary care doctor and I told Dr. Haskins, I said, well, <laughs> you know, after running four miles a day and doing 150 crunches, I finally broke a bone in the top part of my, you got to understand he knows me and he just looks over at his glasses and shakes his head at me. And uh, he said, you got gout. And I said, what's gout? And uh, so I get it about two times a year. And uh, it's, um, it's not fun. It's, it's, it's rough business. Uh, we're going to be uh, bringing a message tonight out of Luke chapter number 24. And what I'm going to have you to do, uh, I'm only going to read while you're standing. I'm only going to read verse 13 down to verse 16, and we'll have prayer. And uh, then you can be seated, and I'll read some more of the passage. It's very familiar to most of you. And while it's on my mind, uh, I hope we, uh, we realize here at Temple how blessed we are. We're tremendously blessed. Um, I, you know, this choir, uh, if you could see, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. They literally sang their heart out. Yes, they, they sang their heart out for the Lord. And it's a tremendous blessing to me. Yes. And then we've got people in this church that, uh, that we can call on in a moment's notice uh, where they don't have time to really get scared. Isn't that right, Sister Angie? And, and then, you know, if you'll notice, Phil... He hangs around in the back. He stays in the background. He's a tremendous musician, tremendous. And we're blessed. We're overly blessed with what the Lord has sent us. I remember preaching in a church, and they didn't, even, they didn't have no music. The pastor apologized, and he said, Brother, we play a tape. And they would put a tape in, and it'd have the songs from the old Redback. And he would play the music, and then the congregation would just, you know, sing the songs out of the Red Book. But they had nobody, nobody to play an instrument. We're blessed. We're blessed. And, and please don't take that for granted. Luke chapter number 24. This is very familiar reading to you. Look at verse number 13. I'm going to read verse 13 down through 16. We'll have prayer. Then you can be seated. The Bible says, and behold two of them. Now, let's get the time element in verse number 12. Look at verse number 12. Here's the time element. Here's where we're, we're dealing. Then arose Peter. And ran into the sepulcher, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. So we know where we're at with the resurrection. This, this is the day the Lord came out of the tomb. Later in the day, verse 13, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus. Emmaus from Jerusalem. Uh, is somewhere between seven and seven and a half miles. It was about a two and a half to three hour walk one way. And so they're leaving Jerusalem and they're going back to Emmaus, verse 14. And they talked together of all of these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Now look at verse 16. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. You'll find the same thing in John chapter 20 when Mary Magdalene was at the tomb and she saw Jesus and supposed him to be the gardener. And her eyes was not opened until he spoke her name. When he spoke her name, she said, Rabboni. She knew exactly who he was. My father, I pray that you would use me I've done the very best I possibly can to try to prepare myself, Lord, to search out diligently the scriptures. And I'm so, I, I'm so convicted and I'm so excited at the same time to be able to share what you've laid upon my heart. It's something that I need help with. It's something that you convicted me of to do more. And I pray you would use it to be a blessing to your people tonight in Jesus' name, you can go ahead and be seated. Keep your Bible open to Luke chapter number 24. And we'll finish this out. 
And he said unto them, What manner, what manner of communication are these that you have one toward another as you walk and so sad? These two disciples, only one of them's mentioned. The Bible purposely doesn't mention the second one, and I think there's a reason for that. If we get to the end of the message, I think the Holy Spirit wanted us to put our name in there. But since it's not mentioned here, just, just one, Cleopas is mentioned, we're not going to attempt uh, to mention who the other one possibly could have been. And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass in these days? They thought it was a strange question. Everybody knew what had just happened in Jerusalem. I mean, it's for everybody knew. But the stranger said, Why, what's the deal? How come you, you, you guys are so sad and, and you're carrying on such a sad conversation? And he said, where, where, where did you, where'd you come from? Do you not know? Don't you understand? Now look at this in verse number 19. It's important. And he said unto them, what things? Now, if you, if you write in your Bible, right beside that, write down John chapter 6 and verse 5 and 6. Write that down. Because you know that when Jesus said what things, he knew what things. Why would he say that? The same reason in John chapter number 6 at the feeding of the 5,000. The Bible said that Jesus looked to Philip and said, huh, huh, Look at all these people. Where in the world are we going to get enough bread to feed these people? But verse number 6, the Bible tells you, Jesus said this to Philip to prove him. And that's exactly what's going on here. When Jesus said in verse 19, what things? It was all about him. He knew exactly what things, but he said this to prove them, to see what kind of answer that he would get from these two disciples. Now, when I say disciples, they were disciples. A disciple is just a disciplined pupil, a disciplined follower. They were not part of the 12, but they were still disciples of the Lord. Now watch this. And they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Here's why they were sad. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all of this, today's the third day since these things were done. Yea, and, and that certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were of us, went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. Now watch this. Watch this negativity coming. But him they saw not. You see that? Oh, they said they saw angels. They said the angels said he's not here, he's arisen. But him, the one we was trusting in, they saw not. Now fasten your seatbelt. Pastor preached this morning about Jesus referring to people as vipers and hypocrites. Right. Now, you put yourself, the, these two disciples are heartbroken. They're heartbroken, genuinely. And they're walking from Jerusalem back to Emmaus, and all of a sudden, a stranger just joins them and starts asking questions. And he listens to their answers. They don't know who it is. Could it possibly be they were looking for the one the last time they saw the one hanging on a cross. The Bible said in, in Isaiah 52 that his visage was so marred, more than the sons of men. They had just walked away from a cross where a man had been beaten to the point that he was unrecognizable as even being a man. For whatever reason, Jesus is walking right beside them asking them questions, and they don't know it's him. Watch this, but he fastened his seatbelt because here it comes. You ready for this? Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Amen. Now look at this. 
and beginning at Moses. Wouldn't you have learned to, oh, wouldn't you have loved to have heard this message? <laughs> oh, man, this is the word that was made flesh. And he's going to reveal to them all through Moses and the prophets, he was about me. Watch this. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them and all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone farther. Now, now did, did you catch all of that? Yeah. I mean, how many still with me? He's asked questions, and he's listened to their answers, and now he said, oh, fools and slow of heart, ought not Christ to have suffered and then entered into his glory? And beginning at Moses. Now, it doesn't record for us exactly what he preached, but I can imagine beginning at Moses. I'm sure he told these two disciples in Exodus chapter 12, I was the Passover lamb. In Exodus chapter number 16, I was the manna that fell from heaven. In Exodus chapter number 17, I was the rock at Horeb that gave your forefathers water. In Exodus chapter number 20, I was the lawgiver. My, my, my. And yet they continue to walk. They still don't know him. I imagine him saying in Joshua chapter 5, I was the lamb that crossed Jordan with you. My, my, my. My, and Isaiah, I was the one that was beaten. I'm the one that suffered. It was me that took on your sin. I was wounded for your transgression. Oh, how would that burn into your heart? My, I can imagine him saying in Jeremiah, I was the potter. Yeah, you was the clay. In Ezekiel, I was the wheel inside the wheel. In Daniel, I was the fourth man in the fire. They had to be Baptist. They had to be. To hear a message like that from the prince of preachers, telling them all of that in Moses and the prophets, it was about me. They just keep walking. I, I think I pastored this group, brother. Nothing can touch them. They just kept walking. They still, they still are oblivious to who it is. Now watch this, verse 29. Look at verse 28 again. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he, Jesus, made as though he would have gone farther. He's got to be thinking, what more can I do? I've painted them a picture. I've told them that Moses and the prophets spoke of me. Verse 29. But they constrained him saying, Abide with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he set at meat with them, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he brake and gave to them. Look at verse 31. And their eyes were opened. If you're breaking bread in someone, that's another word for communion. We call this the communion table where we partake of the Lord's Supper. The breaking of bread is speaking of communion. When he broke the bread, it would draw attention to what? To his hands. <laughs> All that he preached, but when they saw him break the bread, he wasn't breaking it in the synagogue. He wasn't breaking it in the local church. He was breaking bread and communing in their home. And when they saw, when he broke the bread and blessed it, they realized, their, their, their eyes was opened and they realized, this is the Lord, verse 31, and their eyes were opened and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. Now, they're getting ready to make a trip right straight back to Jerusalem, but I bet you they make it in halftime. I bet they go back to Jerusalem a lot faster than they came from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Verse 32, and they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us, by the way. Yeah, but you still didn't know him. Yeah, your heart burned while he talked to the scriptures. 
but you still didn't know him. Your eyes were still closed as to who he was. But they said, did our heart not burn within us while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem, found the eleven gathered together, and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how that he was known of them. How? How was he known of them? How was he known of them? In breaking of the bread. He was known to them by communing with them in their own home. Boy, what a message the Lord has laid out for us. In verse number 15, he walked with them. Let this settle in. In verse number 17, he spoke with them. Their eyes were still closed. In verse number 27, he preached to them, man. I mean the prince of preachers preached to them. Their eyes were still closed. In verse number 29, he abided and he tarried with them. They still didn't know, and yet they knew him not until he broke the bread in their home. Yeah, here's what I want to get to. Here's where I'm headed with this. The only way that you're ever going to really know him for who he is he has to become more to you than somebody you come out and pay your respects to twice a year. He has to become more to you than somebody you just check in with Sunday morning, Sunday night, and every once in a while Wednesday night. If that's all you know of the Lord, you may be saved. You may have called out in believers' uh, 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 repentance and ask God to save you. But let me say, you don't know him. You will never know him for who he is until you allow him, whew, until you invite him home with you. Take him into your home. He reveals himself to you for who he is in your home. Amen. That's where he communes with you is in the privacy of your home. My, my, my. So many people I've met saved, yes, saved. But they don't know the Lord. They don't know much about him at all. They just know enough to get them saved, get what they call fire insurance. My, I'm so thankful. <laughs> I am so thankful that I had the father that I had. I'm so thankful. Man, only God knows how it would have turned out. Their eyes was opened when Jesus came into their home and had communion, communed with them in their home, not at the church, in their home. What if they hadn't invited him in? Because the Bible said he walked as if he would go farther, but they constrained him and said, it's getting late. Said, why don't you come into our home? They invited. They invited him. He didn't bust the door down. They invited him in. And it was inside their home that he broke the bread of communion. That's where he revealed himself for who he really was. Amen. They just thought their hearts burned before. But now the son of God himself has come into their home. A lot of people don't want him in the home. They don't want him in the home. Now you leave him down at church. I had a guy that I used to work with that cussed like a sailor and taught a Sunday school class. I'm telling you the truth, man. I mean, he would put a sailor to shame, but he taught a Sunday school class. And I heard all that I was going to listen to it. And I went to him one day and I said, you know what? I said, you need to keep your fat mouth shut. That was my words. Y you said that? I, well, I could have said worse. And you know what he said to me? We're supposed to, we're supposed to witness for our Lord. I said, you're an idiot. I said, you're a laughing stock. You talk to these guys about going to church and you getting up and singing in church and teaching a Sunday school class and they hear you cuss and tell ungodly, filthy jokes. You know what he said to me? And this is where a lot of people are. He said, you listen to me. He said, what goes on at church, it stays at church. Yeah. He spoke volumes right there. That's how he lived his life. My, my, my. 
If you want the Lord Jesus, listen to me. And I'm not fussing, I'm preaching to me. If you want him to reveal himself to you, that's why Paul said, you know, Moses said, I, I want to know your ways. I want to know your ways in Exodus chapter 33 and in Psalms 103 and verse 7. It said, Moses knew his ways. He knew, he knew the Lord. Let me tell you how to never, ever, 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 ever doubt your salvation ever again. Me to tell you, take him home with you. Commune with him Monday night, and Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Yeah, and you start to understand, I know whom I have believed. You start to see his heart. My, you talking about, you think you love the Lord now? You invite him home. Take him home with you tonight. Amen. Amen. Take it. Everybody's, you maybe you don't have a prayer closet. You know, some people, they, they, they just can't, they can't think for themselves. I had this guy to come up to me at, during a revival, and he said, Brother, I, I, uh, I don't have a prayer closet. Wow. Mm. <laughs> I got a pickup truck sitting around back. I'd like to sell you if you'd be interested. It doesn't have to be. That's a play on words. You need to have a place in your home just for you to commune with him, Amen. talk to him. I was pastoring one church, and I called this dear lady. She was such a wonderful lady, worked in the church, sang. Oh, when she'd sang, it, it, had, it had the breath of God on it. And I had to talk to her one day. And uh, well, you called her when her husband was at work? Well, sure. That's, I, I mean, what's wrong? I, I, I was her pastor. And her little girl, she had two at that time, and her little girl answered the phone and said, Hi, preacher. I said, Hey, sweetie. I need to talk to your mom for just a minute. I'll never forget this. You know what she told me? She said, well, mommy's in her secret place. <laughs> and I thought, that's why the breath of God is on her singing. <laughs> that's why God uses her with those kids. And she said, preacher, we're not allowed to bother mommy when she's in her secret place. I'll have her to call you. Yeah, I said, you, you do that. Yeah. When I talk about a prayer closet, I'm talking about a specific place yeah. Yeah. that you go to right. and you just, I don't know. You know, what a, you know what a fellow told me? If you listen to people, that, just listen to people. And the, and the ignorance just rolls out. He said something to me after I'd preached one night. He said, how do you talk to somebody you can't see? That's what he said. And I said, how do you breathe air that you can't see? You can't breathe the oxygen in the air you're taking in, but you still breathe, don't you? Yeah. yeah. I just don't think I could pray to a God that I couldn't see. Yeah, well, at least he was honest. At least he was honest. Well, what do I, if I invite him home, preacher, what do, what do I do? What do I do? You just get on, this, on your face. Oh, you can stand up. You can pray laying in your bed. I've done that. I did this when this gout hit. I said, Lord, you know where I'm usually at, but if it's okay with you, I'm going to lay you flat on my back, and we're going to talk. Lord said, I'm okay with that. You're hobbling around, can't hardly walk. I can deal with that. But I have a specific place. Now, listen, if I'm preaching something that I don't live, we've been married 50 years. Pastor Lawson has said something numerous times that carries so much weight. If you want to know about a man, talk to his wife. If you want to know the truth about a man, talk to his wife. If I'm preaching something that I don't practice or that's not in my heart, she would get up and walk out that back door and have good reason to do such. I, I, just, I just talk to him like I'm talking to you, Lord. Man, thing come back and bit me again my goodness I wish I was stronger the devil gets me with that every time I need some help with that lay some scripture on my heart today I, I need help with this and I just talk to him like he's in the room with me like he's in the room with me I talk to him and you get to know him and I'll tell you what it does for you you invite him into your home. 
you'll start enjoying the joy of your salvation. On the way to the ER last weekend when I was taking Shannon back to the emergency room, you know what we did not do? Leaving Maynardville and going to Tonova, we didn't say, Lord, why? Lord, why? Lord, why is this happening? We, we, we didn't say that. You know why? We know him. We know his character. <laughs> he doeth all things well. What we done was hold hands and said, Lord, give us a good nurse and give us a good ER doctor. That's, that's what we prayed. And when I got her back there, this little nurse came in and I looked at her name tag and, you know, I didn't have my glasses on. I said, what's your name? Uh, my name's Shannon. <laughs> yeah. I, and immediately I said, thank you, Lord. One down, one to go. Because we've run into some ER doctors that's had me escorted off of the property. Yeah. Because that's my loved one back there. And some of them think they're God. And then the doctor came in, a Spaniard. Shannon, she's a Whitaker. She'll question anything. She'll talk to a fence post. I just let it go. Shannon said, what's your name? And, and he told us his name. And she said, huh, you're not from around here. I mean, huh. Uh, you're not from Union County or, you know, Snake Slick or, uh, or uh, Sharps Chapel. And he, he named a little town, and he said, that's in northern Spain. And I said, wow. Very compassion, compassion in his voice, yeah. even. And I said, well, doctor, we prayed on the way here for a good doctor. He said, the Lord has answered your prayer. Yeah. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? Now, had we been Sunday morning, Sunday night, ah, occasional Wednesday night Christians or disciples on the way to, oh, God, why did you let this happen? Oh, my goodness, Lord, we're trying our best to live for you. Why did you let this happen? Don't understand it. As calm as, as uh, uh, cucumber seed, Lord, give us a good nurse. Give us a good doctor. No panic? No. Why? We've been down that road many times. He's never let us down. But we've learned, we've learned how to commune with him. I saw something in my dad that I've seen in very few people. I, the Lord hears me. I'll stand accountable for what I'm preaching. But when my daddy got saved, man, he got saved. I mean, it was an immediate change. And he started studying the Bible. I mean, dissecting the Bible. When my daddy passed away, he said, I have nothing to leave you. Me and your mom spent every dime we had on you and Sharon. You got it all long ago. And he said, but I'm going to leave you my pickup truck and a box. Shannon, a box of Bibles. <laughs> And I have at home a box of Bibles that are worn out. Once done, he had it rebound several times because it was his favorite. Rebound. I took the one that was his favorite and put it on his chest in the casket. And he wanted his fingers on Romans 8, 18, for I reckon, Brother Tony, that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. But I'd come home. I'm still living at home. Daddy got saved. I was 10 soon after that. The whole family went to church. I got saved. But I watched my dad. I'd, I'd seen church people before. And a lot of times you couldn't tell any difference. You know, I had a baseball coach that was a church person uh, that was just vile and wretched and run around on his wife all the time. But he'd tell you real quick where he went to church. But I'd come in and I'd see my daddy sitting there and, and I'll answer to God if I'm, if I'm exaggerating or saying something that's not true. And my daddy would be sitting there in his chair with one light on over his head. He'd have the Bible open and tears just pouring. Just pouring. Just streaming down his face. And I stood... I stood for I don't know how many minutes and just watched him and think, oh, my goodness, my dad's taking this stuff too far. 
He, this, he's taken this thing way under too far. I've never seen anybody act like that. It got to the point where I went to mom and I said, Mom, I'm worried about him. She smiled and she said, your daddy's fine. He's fine. He generated a hunger. Yeah. Hunger. And he took the Lord home with him. Every night that I lived at home, every single night, there was not a night that went by that I didn't hear two knees hit a hardwood floor. And I'd lay there. And my daddy would pray for his son and his daughter. Every single night. And as I got older, I realized something, brother, that I think it would do some preachers well to know. We cannot do anything without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. We can't do anything, brother Roger, without the anointing and the touch of the Holy One. We can't do anything. And man, I, I wanted to seek after the God that my daddy sought after. I wanted to know that same thing that he had. I wanted the same thing. So I invited him home and I started meeting with him, communing with him. It don't matter if it's in a prayer closet, if it's laying under a table, if it's on the back porch listening to the woodpecker's peck. It don't matter where it's at. Amen. As long as you have a place, you have a place that you meet with him outside of these four walls. That's when you follow on to know the Lord. Two people get saved. I've seen it so many times in pastoring. Two people get saved. One of them generates a true hunger for the things of God, a true hunger for this book, and to get closer and closer to the Lord. And you watch them grow. You watch the Lord keep his hand on them. The other one's saved, but never has a hunger to know more. Never has a hunger for the word of God. Has never had a hunger to invite the Lord home, to commune with them in their home. You know what happens? Give them a little time and they go AWOL. Then I would go visit. Well, preacher, I tried and just can't live it. Oh, man, what a cop out. No, you didn't try. No, you was looking for fire insurance, man. You, you didn't follow on to know the Lord. If you, what's that song? If you knew him like I know him, you would know that he's alive. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And the only way you'll ever know him like that is to take him home with you. That's where he reveals himself for who he really is. That's where you learn to love him. Let, let, let me explain it this way and I'll be through. Let, let me say this and I'll be done. I'll be through, maybe. Men Chan has been married for 50 years. 50 years. We started 50 years ago. We went out five times. My daddy told me I was a nut. My mama told me I was crazy. We went out five times 50 years ago, and I, I evidently had just swept her off her feet, I guess. I, I don't know. <laughs> My dad even asked me this. He said, what's her last name? And I said, uh, don't tell me, don't tell me. Uh, Whitaker, Whitaker, that's her last name. She got a middle name. Yeah, I'm sure she does. Uh, we didn't know each other. We didn't know each other. After a year of marriage, we still didn't really know each other. Two years, three years, four years. I don't want this to be disheartening, uh, Zane and, and uh, Zane and Victoria, <laughs> but I'm bound to preach the truth. But after community. After communing together for 50 years, can you imagine communing with the Lord for 50 years, what you would know about him? Can you imagine how much more you would trust him if you faithfully communed with him in your home for 50 years? You know, it's scary. We know what each other's thinking. And sometimes that can be a bad thing. 
It's scary the way we interact. I was sitting there the other night either watching Gunsmoke or Andy Griffith. That's about all I watch. And all I had to say was, oh, man, you know what sounds good? Uh, and she automatically said, you want a peanut butter jelly sandwich with it? She knew immediately I was talking about a cup of coffee. Yeah. A preacher asked me one time, brother, he said, every time you come to this church, you always request that your wife sing just before you get up and preach. Is there a reason for that? And I said, oh, yeah. Yeah, there is a reason for it. I know her. Did you get that? I know her. <laughs> she sings at home when nobody's around. She sings to the Lord when nobody else can hear. I want her to sing before I preach because I know her. Man. After 50 years, we know each other too well when you know what each other's thinking. It just, it's like uh, muscle memory, man, I'm telling you. It, it, it's scary. And we talk all the time. She'll say, I hope the Lord takes me first. I said, are you crazy? Only a woman could, I mean, my goodness. We just drank a cup of coffee and eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you come up with stuff like that? I don't, I don't understand, but she'll, she'll say, I, I, I hope the Lord takes me first because I couldn't live if he took you first. <laughs> and I'll say, don't say that because I pray every day right here. Right here. Take me first. Take me first because if you take her, I'm a goner. After 50 years, man, you, you, you get to where you're inseparable. My goodness, and to think we're praying and have prayed for years. When Shannon was at her worst, when she was so sick, so sick, I didn't think she was going to live. I can't count the times we'd lay in bed and hold hands and say, just come and get us, Lord. We're ready. We're ready. Just take us both together. You, you, you know what generates a love like that? You know what? Communion. Getting to really know each other. Wouldn't you like to have a love like that in your heart for the Lord? Where you would never, ever, ever doubt your salvation again? Will you begin to know his ways? Where he'd start to open up himself to you. And you'd learn more about his character and who he really is. And how much he really loves you. My, my, my. It should be that when you get in your secret place and you call out your kids' names, your grandkids, if they're out of church, the Lord says, yeah, I've heard that name. I've heard that name many times. I've heard that name many times. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. That's the way it should be in our home. So when you leave tonight, when you leave, don't leave him here. Don't leave him here. And just come breeze by next Sunday and pick him back up again like he was a spire tire. Don't do that. Constrain him. Constrain him to come home with you. It's in your home. It's where he reveals himself for who he really is. That's where you really learn to love him and know him. My Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the truth of the blessed, precious righteous, infallible word of God. There's days I fail. There's days, Lord, that I do not seek your face. There's days I get involved. I get called up in other things and I go through the whole day and I, not one time have I sought your face. Not one time have I communed with you, but I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful as vile and wretched and filthy as I am before I can close my eyes at night, that still small voice speaks to my heart and says, I've missed you today, son. I haven't heard from you today. We haven't communed today. And thank you, Lord, before I close my eyes, I'll always talk to you. And I tell you, I love you. I love you and I thank you for who you are. And I know you love me. And I know that nothing's allowed to come into our life, Lord, unless it crosses your desk and you put your stamp of approval on it. 
I've lived long enough. I've communed long enough with you, Lord, in my house, in my home. I know some of your ways. Some of your ways are past finding out. But I know your character. I know you're a good God. I know you put homes back together. I know you put marriages back together. I know you still make house calls, Lord. Lord, if you just touch one heart tonight, just one heart, just one heart, and give them a hunger, a hunger to invite you home with them tonight and take some time with you tonight to commune with you. It's worth it all. It's worth all the study, the prayer, the, fight, the preparation. It's worth all of it. If just one heart, I know your word will not return void. I know to prosper in the thing where to you sent it. This was such a heavy burden on me, Lord. I didn't preach this message to hurt people. I preached this message because I love them. Because I want to encourage them. And I pray, Lord, as they sing, if someone needs to come, if they need to come tonight, maybe they want to open up the door tonight for you to go home with them. Maybe they want to constrain you tonight to just go home with them and begin a time of communion, of talking with you. I pray they'd come on the very first verse. Thank you for touching me. I felt your presence, Holy One. Thank you, blessed Savior. I love you with all of my soul. In Jesus' name.